Hello, good uh, evening. Very welcome. Nice that I see you all here. Um, some people in the far back like to move a little bit closer. That is still possible. Um, then you can see it even better. And we fill up the empty spots here. Um, I'd like to give a short introduction to the night, to the evening. Uh, you've, of course, seen the program, so you know what you're, what you're here for. Um, if I can get the slide of the introduction. You have the point. Great. We started um, uh, um, now a few months ago at the uh, Amsterdam Academy of Architecture with this uh, lecture series. Uh, 14 lectures on what we call African realities. Um, talking about urban development, architecture, landscape in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Africa, on the continent Africa. Uh, in all the African situations that are, that are so many and so big variety of, uh, of, uh, uh, of areas and, uh, and, and places that um, uh, we call them realities uh, because there are all kinds of perspectives and ways to, uh, to look at it. Um, we are very lucky tonight that um, uh, we are here in Pakhuis, uh, Zwijger, because uh, there are two nights, tonight and next week, that we have actually an, uh, an open platform where more than only the students from the academy can, uh, can take part. Uh, so I'm very happy to see a big audience uh, tonight. We're very happy that you are here. Um, of course, I will do an introduction on, on what you are going to hear tonight, but maybe to sketch a little bit what this series, this lecture series is, uh, I also like to, uh, to tell a little bit of the background of it. Um, it's uh, 14 evenings and we're, we're now here somewhere uh, at the end. Um, um, myself, Remco Rolfink and uh, Pierre Maas uh, here in the front are, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, were asked by the Academy to organize this because of uh, some of our backgrounds. With, uh, with the, we wo both work in the the umbrella organization Dasuda, and that, that is specifically focused on Africa, on the African continent, in the subject of, uh, of architecture and urbanism, uh, to organize this series. Um, and we, we invited uh, uh, lots of people to talk on these uh, perspectives, from uh, agriculture to new towns, from uh, economy to uh, some of the social backgrounds, uh, uh, from housing to, uh, to the development of, uh, of how things are uh, around climate change in Africa, uh, and so on. Um, tonight, um, uh, Michael Umedimo uh, will present, uh, and I will tell a little bit further on about this topic. And so he's part of this series, and uh, I'm very happy that you're here, um, uh, to, to tell us more about a very specific area uh, in, in Nigeria, Port Harcourt, but uh, a background and something, a development that is, I think, um, that you can see in many places in Africa, a social background um, that, that shows the, uh, the, the, the topics and the issues that you find in many places. Um, what's the, the program of tonight? Um, it's actually quite simple. Um, I will introduce a little bit of the series, uh, introduce uh, Michael, of course, and uh, Michael will speak with a lot of images, video, etc., and, and inform you. Uh, I already can say that uh, if you have urging questions while Michael is speaking, don't hesitate. Put up your hand and either Pierre or myself will come up with the microphone. You can ask a question. Uh, everything that you think that can wait and maybe lingers a little longer, then, uh, then we have a Q&A at the end. And I think that we're closing around uh, uh, 9.30. And then there's time for drinks here in the Pakhuis. Uh, for the students, um, uh, when you walk out, there's this signature list for the registration. So that's an important part, I know. Uh, that is at the end. Um, yeah, why, why Africa? Because this, this question came from the Academy. Uh, and the Academy of Architecture is mainly focusing, of course, on all kinds of topics that you find in Amsterdam, in, in Europe, and, and sometimes abroad. Uh, but the African continent is not so widely explored uh, by the assignments uh, given to students. Um, and that is actually strange if you could see uh, what is happening in the world, because uh, especially in urbanism, we see this, uh, this, this huge topic of, uh, of, of, of urban change. And of course, the, the world is urbanizing. Uh, these are figures uh, lately from um, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the UN Habitat. Um, so at the moment, Tokyo, Mexico, Mumbai are the biggest cities in the world. Um, but the population growth is, is dramatically changing uh, uh, this, uh, this view. 
Uh, of course, in terms of the amount, uh, it's, it's happening still in Asia, but look at the growth figure up to 2050, the coming 30 years, uh, the growth really slows down in Asia and uh, Afrique, as this uh, French graph says, uh, is uh, booming. Um, that leads uh, also to, uh, not that leads, the, the reason why it's there, uh, it also shows uh, this fertility uh, uh, figure. Um, all the colorful Africa you can see here, which also means that you can see the average number of children will still uh, be high in, in, on the continent. Uh, completely um, uh, different from, from the rest of, uh, uh, of the world. Um, so in 2025, 20 of the largest cities of the world uh, uh, still will be mainly dominated uh, uh, like this, but uh, even in 2050, you see uh, a bit of the shift uh, uh, with Lagos coming up and Kinshasa and Dar es Salaam, but in the second half of this, uh, this century, uh, things are changing. Uh, with Lagos, Kinshasa, uh, Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, Cairo, Khartoum, uh, t taking over, uh, as it were. So within 80 years, which is not so long, I think uh, some people uh, might be around, um, it's Lagos, Kinshasa and Dar es Salaam with an absolutely staggering almost 90 million people in one metropolis. I wouldn't call it a city, <laughs> it's too big. Um, and the city currently, and that is of course the situation that we have, and this is a picture of Lagos, uh, we will see other pictures of today, but you can see it in many of these cities, the challenges are there. And so we speak about many challenges of infrastructure, systems, structural things that are not um, up to the level that we expect from a city of 20 million people, uh, but this is the situation. And so uh, whether it's traffic, whether it's power, whether it's sewage system, water provision, all these kind of things. So what happens if a city triples uh, and these things are not in place? Um, um, you, can, you can see many of these, uh, these images. So we talk about, and also in this house, I know a lot about circular economy. So what does it mean for uh, the starting point uh, of a city of Lagos or a city of uh, uh, Dar es Salaam? Um, actually, uh, a situation that we will also, I think, see tonight is that the base point from where pe people start is a kind of survival mode. Um, this is um, uh, a dump, uh, dump site estate, a dustbin estate, sorry, dustbin estate in, in Lagos, literally built on the dustbin, and even the land here costs more than, than you find in uh, the outskirts of Amsterdam. So you can imagine that people pay a price to actually live here uh, that they cannot, cannot afford anything else. Um, and then, of course, in the situation, um, yeah, people living on water even, building and extending to, to find a way. Still, if we think about Africa from a broader perspective, I think this image comes up that the continent is, of course, also this. Uh, an endless landscape with a fantastic scenery, uh, with most of the values uh, of our ecosystems uh, still in place. Uh, if we talk in, in terms of, uh, of wildlife, uh, endangered species, etc., still having a, having a natural habitat, it's, uh, it's there. Um, and at the same time, the image that is also being brought forward by many organizations for the last 40 years is something like this, huh? and which is also there. It's not a lie, it's not a Photoshop, it's true. Um, but it's, it's a bit of a limited thing, and that's what we thought, that to, to go into these realities to also show some, some, some other background of it. So to actually uh, look at the development of Africa from, from the impression that is maybe different from uh, uh, where we say diseases or poor or uh, uh, tribes or, or, or whatever, to trade and creativity and the creation of jobs and, and working out talents and, and seeing all kinds of new developments. Um, sometimes it's hard because the challenges are there and we also will see tonight, but um, what we tried to do over the last few months, and I think many of our, we were lucky that many of the speakers picked up on that, is also show the opportunities. We like to talk about the opportunities this, that this new continent and the enormous population growth uh, will deliver. Um, so yes, this sometimes happens and we don't turn a blind eye, but it's one picture, just as the same as the very traditional one. Um, uh, while we at the same moment see, uh, see this, with the huge commercial uh, uh, development in cities, uh, these million cities, uh, I think this is, uh, this is in South Africa, uh, uh, crowded supermarkets uh, that hardly can't, uh, can't cope with the delivery of, uh, of the goods. Um, and at the same time, uh, something that is also growing more and more uh, worldwide, but also on the continent, and uh, I think mo most of the students recognize this as the third time I'm showing it, but um, Johnny Miller made these pictures. 
where you almost think that this is cut as a Photoshop between a neighborhood with swimming pools and big mansions and a, a kind of organized slum area. But this is actually a non-Photoshop picture from, uh, from Cape Town. Um, showing how big the division between poor and rich uh, uh, is also in the cities of, uh, of the continent. Uh, again, uh, closing off as an as a, uh, introduction why we did this, we see all these developments based on the things that we do ourselves in the project that we do with the, with the Suda group, but also uh, uh, with these kind of examples. And I, I like always to show the, the telephone, uh, the mobile phone uh, system. There is no landline uh, uh, connectivity in Africa. Uh, it was very hard to reach each other. Um, but uh, from 93, when uh, the GSM systems were um, yeah, uh, 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 developed worldwide, you see this enormous growth. So um, uh, up till now, um, a situation where we have all five billion uh, uh, connections worldwide. And uh, in a country like, Nar uh, like Kenya, 92% uh, uh, smartphone use. <laughs> so um, that is an enormous catch up. And that, that means that by catching up uh, on that technology with new technology, that's also showing the, the possibilities that are there. Um, so, we've been at many places during our lectures. Uh, again, very lucky because it's a huge continent, you cannot go everywhere. Um, and uh, tonight uh, we will jump to Nigeria and especially to, uh, uh, to Port Hakor, uh, which is at the coastal, uh, coastal delta. Um, yeah, I'd like to sh briefly introduce uh, Michael Umedimo, uh, who's here with us. Uh, Michael is, um, I, I think, uh, yeah, uh, very creative and, and, and uh, uh, widely oriented uh, person, a filmmaker in, in uh, what you also will see, uh, going out there in, uh, in, uh, in the field. Um, I learned today, not born and raised in Port Harcour, but close to it, uh, always been there, uh, uh, close to the community. Um, professionally uh, a lecturer uh, in film at University of Roehampton, a visiting senior research fellow at King's College London, so also very international orientation, um, um, uh, with uh, examples like um, the Oscar-nominated and BAFTA-winning The Act of Killing, um, uh, with the Vision Machine Collective. Um, we met almost two years ago, maybe, in Cape Town, um, uh, where I was fascinated by the fact that this mixture of creativity, social uh, uh, engagement was all mixed and blended, and also with this kind of design principles in it. Um, in that lecture, you, I think you blew a, lot of, a part of the audience away with it. <laughs> uh, I was one of them. Uh, um, I think that because it's a thrilling story, because of, uh, of the, the insight in actual living conditions. Uh, so we're, gonna, uh, we, we're getting close to the people of Port Harcourt tonight. So uh, that travel will, will take us there. It's uh, huge challenges and huge issues. But again, uh, uh, the, the, the specific things that, that um, Michael is showing with, uh, with the organization from CMAP and uh, uh, the Human City Project will also show the opportunities and the... the, the, the uh, yeah, the things that are showing a positive way of making next steps and getting out of these challenges. So I think that is very interesting. Um, the Human City uh, project is uh, community driven. Uh, media, architecture, planning, all will come, uh, come along. So uh, we, can't, we can't wait. And um, yeah, I think again that uh, this, this lecture, uh, uh, Michael will take us to Port Harcourt and let us learn about this city that maybe some people know from the oil stories that you read in the, in the newspaper, but um, not much more than that. Uh, so uh, hopefully after tonight you can, uh, you can tell about Port Accor from a different perspective. Um, Michael, can I ask you to the stage and take us there? Good evening, folks. Lovely to, to be here. So, I want to share some stories with you from our project, the Human City Project. It's a presentation in two halves. The first half, violence by design, and the second, makeshift construction of trust or building trust. So, part one. Before I say anything, I just want to, to show you something. It's a, a short piece 
that marks the very moment that the project began. It's, it's animating impulse, and also because it will give you a sense of the, of the urban context, the, the situation we were responding to. Then came, they came 7.30, they came with their bulldozers, and they came with their soldiers. Can you prepare to take us from here? Are you prepared? This way. This way. This way. Front, front, front. Go front. Step, 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 Gradually, yes. Look at the government agents sent government agents to remove all these things. Remove all these uh, things and uh, they are best. So that the people living living with wrong. Mm. See the man. See a house there. He was right inside the house. The agents, the government agents, came and started to look in the, the house. Ojina to pick from the house. Arresting people. The the the, the soldiers and the police are arresting people. The both the women and uh, the children to put uh, up there. Jafra and Nigerian war don't survive. What is this type of war? Don't know. Are they looking for my life? 
After the demolition my place, I don't have where to stay. I hang around for two weeks. No money. I don't expect that that day they will come and demolish that place with Swamp Boogie. So now I hang around with my children, with six children. I hang around, I have a place to stay. Even a place, even to have money to pack my things to play, I don't have. Me, I'm not a lazy woman. I'm not a criminal, I'm not a militant. I'm a struggling woman. I do business. I do petty trade rice, beans, tomatoes, I sell. I go to have buy things and sell. I'm not a lazy woman. I'm an industrious woman. I, I do business. I'm a struggling woman. And now the government frustrates me. There's no way to. Even though my property was scattered, my things, my business was scattered. No way to not to start even the business. No way to manage. No way even to put my children in the school. That place is our home where we brought up. Are we supposed to be in refugees in our own lands? We are saying that we are not wicked, but we are here to develop our community. That the, the God of heaven has given us the power to bring up the young ones that are perishing and hopeless. Hunger, strife, Papa, Jesus, we will not suffer because of your wisdom. Let the men be in their area. We will not tolerate any form of criminality in this community. We are saying, please leave us alone, oh, let us stay in our place. So we have noise and violence, daddy, grandma, your life. Tamu no basi se wachere, grandma, eh. Ida ya de, 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 So that's, that's the context. I just want to step back 500 years or so and just help us think about why this city is structured the way it is. So Port Harcourt in the Bight of Benin, the Bight of Biafra, is in a part of the world which for five centuries has been one edge of the Black Atlantic, a space across which a dark cargo was traded. First of all, human beings, then palm oil, then coal, then crude oil, all hydrocarbons. And the science, the art of cartography, of map making, of design, was deeply implicated in the construction of this space. And indeed, colonial master planning inscribed in this space the social violence of segregation and the material violence of extraction. This is a map that constituted Port Harcourt as a crown possession through an act of dispossession. It took a tangle of creeks of small fishing settlements and farms and made them into a city which was explicitly created to be the staging post for the extraction of colonial resources. It was the railway terminus from Manugu where the coal came and the deep water port that took that coal out around the colonial coast of West Africa. And if you look at this map, which actually comes from a, an archive in the Netherlands, you see something ostensibly drawn by a newly independent Nigerian government in 1962, just after independence from the director of geological survey. But if you look over here, you see that it was compiled by air and ground photos by Shell BP. So the map of Port Harcourt was literally drawn by Shell. And that did something very strange to the space of the city. It divided it 
into the depths, the unseen, uh, an abstractly represented space here, a, a seismic survey, a space described in terms of cubic feet, barrels, quantified, and plugged into the global economy. And then there was the space of, of the surface, the space where we live, the space where people make their living. But try fishing and farming in these waters. The wildlife. Now, as you may know, Port Harcourt is the oil capital of Nigeria, the continent's largest producer. And of that economy, at a conservative estimate, 10% is informal. That's about 150,000 barrels a day, the, the equivalent of the total national production of Ghana in 2013. Produced in what's quaintly called artisanal refineries, spaces like this. But that informal production is almost exclusively sold on the open market. Product from there will travel along the canals here and might be blended. And the blends which are clean, say under five parts per million, will be sold here. Slightly more permissive, 15 parts per million will go to the States. And then the dirty blends, 3,000 parts per million, will be sold back. And the impacts are profound. This is, this is the space that Port Harcourt grew in. It's a space where in a single frame you can see the structural violence of inequality. This is a community which is literally sinking into the sea as oil and gas is sucked up from underneath it and the land depresses as the sand is dredged to build the ground for that facility and as the tankers produce wave action which erode it. And then in the city itself, here the native quarter, very dense squat barracks and here the European quarter where I live, leafy setbacks lawns. Whatever the formal intentions of the master planners, they've been overwhelmed by massive oil fueled growth. And all around the city, these very dense waterfront settlements, this is just the southern tip of the city. Here, about 93,000 people live. Nearly half a million people across the city in these waterfronts. All of them were declared for demolition. And it's important to realize when you see images like this, even though the official language is the language of marginality, this is the core urban condition. 80% of all population growth in Nigeria is urban, and of that, 80% is informal, slum growth. Currently, around 79% of all Nigeria's city dwellers live in slum conditions. So this is the future of Nigeria on current trajectories. It's the state of things, but there is no state presence. And so you see the kinds of images you associate with, with slums, overcrowding, lack of durable housing, sanitation issues. This is just in front of our project site, chronic insecurity, prejudicial policing, and of course, stark inequality. So this is the reality. This is the reality of the urban form. But this is how the government imagines uh, we will proceed. It's, it's some kind of pastoral petro-utopia. And this has impacts. So 
in, in this next uh, series of clips, one taken from the internet, it's the launch of the Greater Port Harcourt Development Master Plan, the plan which is supposed to guide the development of our city for the next 50 years. And then the clip after that from some cameras we gave to participants at a demonstration against demolition. something swiftly to save their lives. Nothing happened at all. This stark denial of reality has very violent consequences. And in Port Harcourt, this is essentially the face of, of urban development. It's a militarized form of urban development. This is the governor addressing a, a community meeting. It's worth looking at some of the images from these demolitions, because they resemble scenes of a natural disaster, like a post-earthquake or tsunami. But here, the force of destruction is political decisions. People tend to dismiss uh, forced evictions as some kind of technical domestic issue, but the human impacts are, are profound. And they're part of an unmaking of the city, an unmaking of the polity, which has really profound effects for all kinds of representation, how we represent the world to ourselves. And in this short clip, you'll see the kinds of impacts it has for political representation. innocent people, you see, and now came back today telling us to pack our things and go that they want to scatter the place. I'm talking to you now. This is a caterpillar, a place scattering at front there. So as you can see, everybody is packing. I'm not the only one, not the, the last or the least people are seen packing. I don't have anywhere to go from here. I am my shy. Just yes, she's no room to live by herself. So we are packing. God will help us.
don't destroy everywhere. Nothing, nothing, see, see, everything. My children clothes. Both in my wife, they sell everything. See here. See what she they sell here. And I saw them demolish them. I don't bet the bulldozer man make it only give me 20 minutes. Make I carry anything, you no know, green. Why human beings don't go get mine? If they don't feel exercise sympathy, no warning alert. No, no warning sign. We elected the government. Look at what they have done to us. Is this democracy or autocracy? Or are we military regime? It's not democracy. We, we are, I see my voters start here. Where I go to cast my vote, will, will I have the mind to vote again? Come in here election time. But life goes on. People go to school. So, how do we respond? It might seem perverse in the face of that immediate and overwhelming violence to talk about cinema. But if you think back to the first clip that I showed, do you remember that as soon as people saw the camera I was holding, they started directing me. Film this, film that. Immediately, people recognized the camera as an instrument that they could use to focus on what was important to them, to frame their story. And that day, when I was arrested, they smuggled the camera away and got it back to me. It was something that they felt they needed to protect. And I cut together that little piece, sent it to Amnesty, and they used it as part of their Demand Dignity campaign. It was a global campaign. And they sent it back to me with their logo on the back. And we took it round on a small screen like this, round communities that had been demolished or were under threat of demolition. And something happened. People recognized themselves. They recognized themselves as recognized. People who had been treated as if they were invisible suddenly saw that they were high, highly visible. And this really galvanized community mobilization. So we thought we'd add a little bit of theater to the cinema. We got this blow up screen. And that gave us a new kind of mobility. This is actually in Makoko in, in Lagos. And the community that you see on the screen is the community that the screen is in. So again, it's, it's a way of, of owning one's own image. And we found that cinema was just a really useful way of gathering people, of focusing them, of animating them. So we started thinking, if we have the camera, if we have the screen, what other forms, what other spaces of representation could we develop? We thought about the streets. Because even though this is the majority condition, in many ways, this is an invisible condition. So we just wanted people to come out onto the streets, to change the, the temperature and the rhythm of the streets. We had posters, we had bus wraps, we had billboards, we had t-shirts. This billboard, the governor pulled down. Because this simple statement of fact, people live here, is inadmissible. It's obscene to the official discourse. Here, you see Prince. Do you recognize this guy from the first video? That first video was the moment that I met him. And the camera that he's wearing around his neck here is the camera that I first saw him through. And not only did he feature in the campaign, he's now our community media officer. So Prince, in many ways, embodies the, the trajectory of the project. And this clip, too, that I want to show you to give you some sense of why cinema, image making, might be significant in this respect. This is a performance uh, on the 12th of October, 2017. The 12th of October 
2009 was the shooting at that demonstration that you saw in that project. So 12th of October, 2009, women singing and dancing in protest, and they're shot. 12th of October, 2017, women singing and dancing in protest, and they're celebrated. Something of the movement. The performance is at an event called Felebration, which is Nigeria's largest music festival, and the venue is the New African Shrine. It's a building that Felakuti, who's heard of Felakuti? A few of you, okay. He, he's, uh, he's one of Nigeria's most uh, famous musicians, and he released an album called Zombie, which upset the army, so they threw his mother out of the window and burnt down his venue. This is the venue that he rebuilt. And the song they're singing is a version of Zombie, and it's been reversioned. So this is about demolition. They're saying, uh, you send bulldozers to make graveyards out of our communities. Zombies live in graveyards. Zombies don't think. Zombies don't speak out, but we sing, we protest. You tell us we have no right to land. You'll, you'll get the idea. Zombie looking 
So is justice. Another form of representation we wanted to develop was legal representation. So for that same shooting, we took the government to court. Not to a national court, there was no point, to an international court. And the wheels of justice grind slowly, but they grind fine. And after five years, we won. This is the moment that the verdict came through. That's Joy. She was 17 when she was shot. You saw an x-ray of her leg. And Joy by name, Joy by nature, this is the moment that she got the verdict. So that is the context for the Human City Project. We just wanted to let people in. We wanted to remain rooted in the community, but to have impact at city level. Um, let me just show you a short clip to give you an idea. This is a, a short clip which will give you the big idea of, of the project, I hope. baby. <laughs> What do you have to You see this place where they are? Now, water before. Where our papa, them come, come down and fish our people. They come carry this mud, big, big mud, come stone here. As you see this house, it they deep, deep inside the ground. All here, now money they take by all here, now mangrove, then cotton, cotton. This place where you see so. Now here they born me. Now here, my mama and my papa married, stay, born me. 
And here she died. We carry her go that way. Go bury her. As you see, Mr. Donnie, 56 years. This 56 years where I did so, I, know, I never go any other place. I hear. Even another town, I never go to any place. Me are from this place. I don't know whether I'm waiting uh, with the year, whether they won't push us to the way here. If they won't carry us to the way, we don't know where to go. Me and my picking them. Yeah, man, what's up, man? Hey, let's sing. Yes, man, man. What are you sure? Let's play, man. How's up? How are you? Everything nice, man. Right. Let's play, man. God bless. God bless that, man. Let's go. 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 let us go government's a joker. There, 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 there is no good plan they have made. If they want a development here, they have to partner with the people who owns the place. You want to take me out of my place, you won't let me know, you won't discuss with me, you won't tell me what exactly you want to do in my place. We are not in war front. This is a democracy. There is nothing like power there. You have to discuss with people amicably. That is what democracy speaks. So if they want to do something and they are conscious of democracy, they will consult so that we discuss. It's not by fight. It's not by using the military. We are saying that we are not wicked, but we are here to develop our community. That the, the God of heaven has given us the power to bring up the young ones that are perishing and hopeless. Hunger strike, Papa. Thank you very much, sir. We are people can actually use their voice. As you can see on this map, we are well represented on this map, but in the government map, we are not there. All this area that we are seated is green, meaning people don't leave. That is why you see one in our campaign, we say, people leave here. You, you, I think you were there. So if we have something like this for, for all the communities, we mark each house where we need water, where we need drainage, where we need road, where we need school, where we need clinic, but also the history of this place. We can also tell the stories of the communities. One of the things that everybody said was they wanted a building that sent a signal. They wanted a building that was iconic. They wanted a building from which they could speak, but also a building which allowed them to be seen. There was a question of do we put maybe part of the building on water or do we put some of it on water, some of it on land? And the, so the, the consensus from the community that why don't we do something that is partly on water and partly on land? There's a door here. And there's another here. So that should be the staircase. There's a staircase, I believe, for that somewhere here. Yes. yes. That takes you to this level. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I was looking at. Like. While constructing this thing, we should put Bear that in mind. We have a very big tide that comes that can even close to this platform. Okay. In that case, here is more needed. Okay. You understand me? Yeah, yeah. The so boat can now come yeah, here, can come very here. close to it. Yeah, yeah. So, while doing anything, we should consider the height of that tide that comes. Okay, so you are going to find out the height of the tide for us. <laughs> I help us with that. Okay, so you coordinate with it because this is now your responsibility. This community has a huge amount of intellectual capital, and I see that. And, uh, and I think for the first time, um, they will get an opportunity to move themselves into 
sort of a new era of change. I think we are moving away from just saying we're not going to agree, we're not going to agree, to a position where we are telling the government that actually we want you to come and partner with us. We want development. Development is part of our right. So we, we are now requesting for, we are pushing the government to come and partner with us for development, not for eviction. Let the men be in their area. We will not tolerate any form of criminality in this community. We are saying, please leave us alone, oh, let us stay in our place. So we have noise and violence that the Ikroma Yolaye. Tawuno Basi say, watch out, Ikroma Okay, so that's, that's the big idea. Um, ideas for a grand building, but we wanted to start small so that we could make mistakes, and we've made plenty, which we can talk about later. Uh, we wanted to, to start small. Um, so we made, we made the media shed. It's actually in the wrong order, that slide, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so we wanted to move from the current position, social exclusion, to participatory development. And when we spoke to people and asked them what the issue was, what they lacked and what they needed, everybody said voice. And when we thought what it might mean to build a platform for community voice, people came back with a very literal answer. They wanted a radio station, somewhere where they could speak. And that forced us to start thinking about how that voice would be sheltered, how to house that voice. So that pointed us towards architectural design, how to build that space. And we realized very early it was important that we didn't start to fetishize architecture, the building. So we developed a participatory mapping project which would keep people thinking about the relationship between any one building and the site and the neighborhood and the city. And the information that was gathered through that mapping project and the networks that were created through that inquiry would be used to support a series of community-led pilot projects, low cost, high impact. And all of that would feed into what we call the people's plan because people were conspicuously absent from the master's plan. And to support all of that with international campaigning. So that's, that's the big idea. That's the, the structure of the project. This is us setting out to make the media shed. It is literally a shed. Everyone gets involved, maybe some health and safety issues. But it's an opportunity to start planning together, to start thinking about collaborative construction, to start thinking about, in a concrete way, what sustainability might mean. And because all our facilities are solar powered, it's a place that's silent and lit. So you get people coming, plugging in their phones, occasionally doing their ironing. And it's a space to gather. It's also the town hall. It's a space that's changed what was a quite dangerous and dead area in the community into quite a playful area. It has exhibition space, and it was the site of our first radio training studio. So we gathered people from all across the city, let them get hands on, and asked them to go back to their communities and send in candidates. We selected about 40, and they've now had a training of about three and a half, four years. Really intensive, sustained training, including what we call thinking in the box. So not just operations, but maintenance, how, how to, to maintain your facility. And these people really see themselves as custodians of their community's 
voice, gathering the sounds and stories of their community. We also started a music project. Um, you saw one of the outputs from that. I'll just play you another song, um, just to give you an idea of the sound. It's a, it's a collaborative project, so we bring musicians from all around the world to, to work with, with local musicians. And so the sound that is coming out of the shed is very different from the Niger pop, very different from the, the sound you hear coming out of Nigeria uh, commercially. Can you just play that song? I don't want what I've been sold Money, power, greed, control Why work your body to the death Where you can focus on the rest uh, yeah. I hear voices, yet all I see is kept silence Police brutality and politics, they cause violence I hear sirens, ambulance with dead bodies of the miners After we vote, they stop to mind us Watch your hands off a cage like punches pilots Propaganda plus lies, now them use bias This man can't see us, now only we they see them Yet yeah, they say that we need them, our money they sweet them Got them, all these things, now they make me rest quick Make us promises and when they win, they forget quick with the young ones think of death quick I get with the system is that sick Brothers is that brothers Mothers betray daughters Advising me to say slavery just to bring rubbers Sons drop out of school men to become rubbers This is just a few men among others Where you're frustrated but they are not brothers. I don't want what I've been sold Money, power, greed, control why work your body to the death When you can focus on the breath I came from London to check up on your area To see what I want for the people in Nigeria I go chop a goosey soup and I chew upon the suya You say me how you day, I reply oh yeah tell ya Observe, observe how my sisters there are happy with that ting and ting See what misery, men, money and corruption bring Chicago Community radio station, broadcast vibration, love and innovation Send out the signal, Radio Chicago Educate the politician, educate the popo This is how new school business is done blood put away the gun blood start having fun blood my people on a mission they come in self-sufficient creating less pollution discovering nutrition more shared resources less competition chicoco eardrum radio vision drug of the nation i don't want what i've been sold Bloody drum and bass in Port Harcourt. Um, then the big building. Uh, before we even started thinking about physical design, we spent a lot of time asking people what values they wanted a building to embody, what histories they wanted it to describe, what futures they wanted it to gesture to and then what functions they wanted it to serve. So we distilled some stuff. I put down swimming pool, because it's quite important to me. Um, people voted, and nobody 
voted for swimming pool. I wasn't allowed to vote. Um, so we, we get a, a process through which people get to practically shape their space. It's an iterative process, backwards and forwards. And out of that came a series of concept designs. These were then, again, focus group, workshopped. Everyone got involved. And this is, this is a really alien process in Nigeria. All development is totally top down. If you're lucky, you're given something. You're dashed something, your community, by the government. Uh, so people started thinking about how to articulate this new uh, approach. So this is a little, um, a little infomercial that the crew produced to try and uh, explain to their neighbors how they approached development. But we will watch it a little bit later. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, hang on, I can, it's, uh... yeah. Many voices make a city. Let's hear what the city has to say. Yeah, my If we want better market, make we keep quiet and listen to the experts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am the architect for this project. I was trained at Oxford University and I have designed mansions and shopping malls all across the country for the past 30 years. So designing your community's new market will not be a challenge for me. I am the engineer from Cambridge University. I build big bridges and big skyscrapers. The architect and I are the experts who will lead this project. Make on a wait, make on a wait, make on a wait. Me self, I be export to. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> export or expat? You are an expert in what? Export or expat? I no one know the one why I be. I no be etiquette. I no be engineer. Now for this community, nine them born me, and me I be market woman. I know the kind of shop where market people them they like. I know the dirty where every line for the market they produce make on our wait. How on I want to build this market if on no plan and with us? That's true. Yes, no, not true. Not true. Come, 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 come. come. Oga architect, oga engineer. Come. I've been telling the people make them listen to Ona. Now I beg. Make on our listing to the people, oh. Make Port Harcourt a city for all its citizens. Your city, your future. Find out more at www.cmapping.net. Whatever, you get the idea. Um, Long live Nigeria. So, we hold that this participatory process, it's not, it's not a, a token social gesture. If we get it right, and Clearly, we don't always. It leads to technically superior outcomes. It leads to the gathering of, of information that we need to know how to make a building that people want and need. So this was the big idea of the first design process. How to make a building that was iconic and that gathered together all our different community initiatives and how to deliver a civic scale building in a really dense space. And so here you can see one of the, the key dynamics of the project, which is to set up a catalytic relationship between the co-production of inclusive public discourse and the participatory production of open public space. So here you have the, the radio studios, which literally open up an open public space. Something that can respond to the very varied and various public needs 
including watching Charlie Chaplin. We have indeed watched the tramp there uh, in that space. Um, so we were thinking a lot about the social urbanism and South America and Medellin and the way in which they used technologies of, of access to try and promote social and spatial integration. And we were trying to do the same thing with technologies of communication. But as I say, we, we didn't want to fetishize the building. So we're always thinking about the site, its relationship to the rest of space. And so that brings us on to the mapping project. And um, we, again, started with stories. We wanted to really create an understanding that maps don't simply describe what is there. Maps produce space. They're, they're part of the production and reproduction of, of social power. And so we looked at colonial cartography. Then we played games to try and get people to inhabit this really strange space where you, you abstract space, make it a, a, a field of coordinates, and then you abstract your eye from yourself and look down on yourself in this abstract space of coordinates. Puzzles, rough mapping, and then actual field mapping. This has been quite an extensive uh, research effort, and it has led to, to some really uh, significant training and to some quite high quality outputs. We now have the deepest, most detailed data sets of any part of the city, let alone the informal parts of the city. And uh, recently, the community mapping cohort uh, won a bid to carry out a, a technical assistance program for the World Bank on sanitation services in, in the city. So this also gives us an opportunity to bring people together around their own space to allow them to get hands-on and, and think about shaping their own space. So this is the simple premise that if you have accurate and appropriate information, you can bring, to bring together lots of different stakeholders. So here you have young men talking to senior police officers, something that would ordinarily not happen in a space like this, about security issues. So this, this is, is it. Um, Again, just a, a, an illustration of that dynamic of the relationship between open discourse and open space. Here's a, a choir practice for a tree planting. The tree, unfortunately, didn't last the night. It got eaten by the goats, but <laughs> next time. Um, so just, just to, to finish off, here is a, a two-minute um, song, which is part of a proposal uh, to Comic Relief, who, who is one of our funders, we, we needed to describe the project in two minutes. So we had a chat. Uh, I went off somewhere, and this is what they, uh, they made. So this is the project in, in their voice. Not this one. You've seen it. Yes. Thank you. My heart's a radio, it only beats for the truth We want a station that can speak out for the youth Where our stories make the news Where we have options, we will choose To watch facts instead of fiction Reality is no sci-fi, no green screen picture Is our story, what do we need a script for? Don't try to sugarcoat the bitterness of being poor Radio Cinema Chicago. This 
space will do big, but now we do it small. Great opportunity to break the wall of setback, oppression, and forced eviction. In the slum, create a space for our dreams and vision. Put ourselves in the map, be a part of the city. People live here, we want to live free. proposal writing processes. So there, there are a whole bunch of these Chikoko initiatives. Um, we're going to develop Chikoko Solar, going to develop a health platform, catering, urban farming, coding, and paralegals. So that really is it, apart from the last 43 second clip which is the whole thing in 43 seconds. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, great story and wonderful to, to see it and to see it developed also after, after last time. Um, I can imagine that there are comments or questions or notes from the, from the audience. Um, can I give the word to anybody? Or objections? <laughs> Now, now you are a few years further, how is the reaction of the government? So, obviously when the project started, it was a very adversarial relationship. It was very tense. But we saw very early on it was strategically important to move from opposition to proposition. Not just to say no to something, the very necessary and urgent task of saying no to forced evictions, but also to say yes and to have something to put on the table to say yes to. So we worked really hard on engaging the government. We, we have technical cooperation agreements with the Ministry of Urban Development, Ministry of Housing and, and Water Resources. Now there's a staggering lack of capacity there, um, but we have, uh, we have shifted things. I mean, we halted all forced evictions for two and a half years, and now the, the intensity of forced evictions is an order of magnitude less intense. Um, and we have some projects which I don't want to jinx by talking about now, hopefully not too long away, which will involve a step change and will need the government and the communities to be co-owners and co-implementers of 
at, at a different scale. So that will be the real challenge, the real test. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, I th it's an amazing uh, project that you have there. And the, do you uh, also see sim similar projects or startu startups in other slums happening? In uh, June, uh, I'll be going to back to Cape Town, where a bunch of people have been invited by the African Centre for Cities, um, to ask and answer that question. Um, I, I know that there's some really exciting things happening around the place, but they're not connected enough. And, and there hasn't yet really been developed a space where um, there can be real exchange and, and, and encounter. So that, that's a really important question, and it's one that we're, we're trying to ask better and, and find ways of, of answering more usefully. Uh, is there any involvement of local universities or cultural people that might help the, the process? Yeah. Um, now we're really we're just developing an MOU with the University of Port Harcourt, and we really want to have deeper engagement with local universities. To date, most of our academic engagement has been international, has been with universities in in the UK or the US, um, and I think that this is really key because the most significant impacts are going to be generational, and so it's it's really important that we lock in to the local education system. Um, so there hasn't yet been a lot of local academic engagement, but it's starting, and, and over the next two years, it, it will pick up. Um, how far is the developing of the building itself? Good question. <laughs> okay, so um, we recently got a, a significant grant which will allow us to build a big building, the, the media center, Chicago Space. The question of whether it is that design uh, is one which is currently uh, contentious. There are a few really challenging realities like, I don't know, gravity, for example, um, which make building that particular design in a swamp hard. And, and one of the things that we've learnt through this process uh, about participatory design is that in many ways it has to be more rigorous, more formally disciplined than uh, you know, many commercial or traditional projects because you don't have the space. You know, you're working with real constraints, constraints of budget, constraints of capacity. And so you know, we're very excited to be uh, going on this design adventure again, we have to ask some fundamental questions about whether we go all in with that design as is, whether we try some quite radical value engineering, or whether we, we reimagine something. Um, so you know, the good news is that we are going to build something. And it is, I think, strategically significant. We don't want to fetishize the building, but it is a strategically significant part of the project to be able to point to something, to have this attractor object, this boundary object, which concretizes a lot of, of, of the values of, of the project. Um, so 
does that answer your question? Um, we're going... Well, you can, ask it, you can ask it again in a different way. But basically, we will be starting this year starting on a big construction project, but it won't necessarily end up looking like those renders. But, but, that's, but that's, I mean, that's another lesson for us, right? Because you see something, and it's like, it has to be that. Even though there isn't, there isn't a, a platonic realm of, of ideal buildings for that space, but it's the one that has become real in people's imaginations, right? So that introduces a whole host of negotiations. Um, yeah, how you manage people's expectations, including yours, having just seen those pictures. Uh, your project is going on for a couple of years, it seems like, and it's growing. Um, who's funding it? More than a couple of years, actually. I mean, uh, now nine and a half, nearly, nearly ten. I mean, when it started, no one was funding it. It wasn't a project, right? It was just us running around trying to respond um, and making tactical alliances with Amnesty International, with, with various people. And we got, to, we got to a point where we had achieved a lot just by kind of urgent force of will, and we realized it was time to kind of more strategically systemize it. So we went out looking for funds. Our initial funders were uh, comic, major funders were Comic Relief, it's a UK charity, Cities Alliance, and Amnesty. There were some smaller ones, like the United States Institute for <clears throat> Peace. Um, and now on the second round of funding, uh, our major funder is the Novo Foundation, Radical Hope Fund. Um, we had some commercial contracts, like from the, from the World Bank, uh, and we have uh, a grant from GIZ, German Development Agency, and a couple of other ones which I don't want to jinx by mentioning uh, until confirmation comes through. So, you know, in many respects, you're kind of from your traditional development agency type through to your quite kind of new agey, uh, uh, large ph philanthropic kind of venture. Do you get a part of this funding? Pardon, do I? Do you take part of this funding? Do the filming? No, the funding of the project. Funding. Do I funding. take part? Funding. Do I if take part in money. the funding? Yeah. Do I, do I like write the proposals and stuff? No, but if you earn money on this project. Oh, do I earn money? Do I have yeah. a salary? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. Sorry. So for the first, for the first uh, until August 2016, I was paid by my university. I was a lecturer. Um, just at the beginning of the project, we, we got a grant, uh, and I got an offer from another university, and I went to my dean. I said, look, we got this grant. They said, great. I said, I got this offer. I said, OK, what can we do? I said, let me go off and, and do this project. And then the university went through a restructuring, and I think they just forgot about me. Um, so I was out there on, on this project. And at some point, they noticed and said, you have to come back and teach. Um, and uh, I said that I couldn't. So I, I left. And that was the end of my salary uh, from the university. So you know, uh, I, too, need to keep body and soul together. So I, I, do, I do have what approximates the salary. Um, you know, uh, and although we've had and have a lot of volunteers and, and are driven by a lot of volunteer work, we, we do feel it's, it's okay for people to um, like pay their rent and stuff. Uh, yeah, you're talking about we, but how are you structured then? How many people are you? Um, so CMAP, as, as the collaborative media advocacy platform, as the organization 
which is looking to launch all these community-owned initiatives, Chicoco Radio and this and that, in CMAP, uh, they're really a handful of people. So there's Anna Bernaldo, who is uh, the director of media programs. She's uh, an audio engineer and runs all of the uh, audio and, and media programs. There's Barbara Summers, who's an urban planner, and she's a community planning lead. Uh, Victoria Howard, who's the journalism lead. Fubara Samuel, who is a community engagement manager. Uh, Pamima, who's, I don't need to look, like nine, between seven and nine people. Prince Peters, who's the community media officer. Um, so it's, it's not big. But then we have about 40 to 60 core participants and then a broader network of you know, up to 200 uh, volunteers and, and participants on the ground. We need more people. I mean, just to say, it's like, th that, that is, and it somewhat relates to your question about whether we're getting paid. Is, you know, I'm sure if we could, uh, if we had more money, we would hire more people. You know, because it's it's kind of impossible. Um, uh, but yeah, it's difficult to find the right mix of, of of capacity and craziness to, you know. Do that. Yeah, that's <laughs> Yeah, how much is, is, I was wondering, how much does lean on you? Your well, well, people make things happen, right? I mean, yeah. you, so you can't, you can't do stuff without people doing it. Mm -hmm. if, if you mean uh, what would happen if I got run over by a bus, right? Well, I know some people would be upset. Um, uh, I hope that in, in three years' time, let's say, it would have less of an impact on the project than it would right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the issue in terms of capacity is not production. Or doing it. Like, as you can see, people are massively talented and prodigiously productive. The real challenge is at the level of management and governance. And also negotiating this, this space of funding and, you know, that kind of space which takes a specific kind of orientation that comes, you know, not exclusively, but mainly from having had a, a tertiary education in a particular cultural context. But uh, what if, if you weren't joining the project anymore, would it continue? I hope so. I mean, Go. <laughs> I, 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 I hope so. I mean, it, it would be weird if it didn't, because what would that mean? That people are just, I mean, I'm, I, am, I can sometimes be very enthusiastic, but I'm, I'm sure that people are not just taking part in the project so that they can hang out with me. I, I can get quite <laughs> irritable. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Thanks. A question over here. Thanks. Um, Al Jazeera made a documentary about your project and they titled you Rebel Architect. They didn't, not me. They titled someone else the Rebel Architect, Kunle Adeyemi. I'm not an architect. I, I don't have any kind of disciplinary competence at all. You know, I stand <laughs> mm -hmm. in the corner and wave my hands about. I can't do anything, really. I was just wondering, how, do, would you agree with the term rebel, though? Um, uh, in, that, in the context of that program, um, I mean, I, I would, it's, it's the title of a series on Al Jazeera, right? They want people to watch their programs. And uh, uh, I, 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 I can't speak for Kunle's practice, whether he is, he is a rebel or not. I would say that to, we're not trying to rebel, we're trying to make something. We're trying to make something different. We're trying to make a space which is different. Who, who was it? Is it Bucky who said, uh, rather than trying to fight 
the world that you don't want, just make the one that you do. Um, so we're, we're just trying to make something. Um, how do the uh, other slums around uh, this slum react on, on the FOSS which is around? Like, how do they cope with all the, uh, the radio station and so on? Well, the participants are drawn, obviously the, the physical site can only be in one place at one time and you know if we get more resources we'd like to do other things in other places but um the participants come from across the city and that's something we made a concerted effort to do at the beginning of the project um understanding that it would be really important to to make sure that people didn't perceive this project in the way that many projects are perceived as a a gift or a dash or largesse to a particular, you know, place. So we work really hard to try and build solidarity, which is very difficult because it's a space pervaded by suspicion. And that's why we talk about makeshift constructions of trust. I think our most important resource, what we need more deeply than anything else, is to build trust. And that's something that's very hard to do. You can't design it in the way that you can design a building. And, yeah. Uh, oh, now many. One over there, I come to you. We first, I'm here now, so. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, you first started off with a very dramatic image uh, of the region. Uh, if there was a real turning point, uh, yeah, uh, do you think you could lay over that? If you, if there was a real uh, turning point, could you point it out, and uh, could you also bring that turning point as a uh, that catalyst for that turning point to other regions? Do you think that's possible? We get asked quite a lot about replication. I'm I'm somewhat ambivalent about the notion because we. I didn't go to Port Harcourt to start this project. I went back to Nigeria to make a film, right, coming out of another film project, and stuff happened. And you make friends, and uh, you pile up obligations, and then you know, you're resisting what you're doing, and then finally you give in, and you make a decision that this is what I'm going to do. And I think one of the strengths of the project is that it's organic. It, it, really has grown out of a particular place, particular people facing a particular situation. That said, certainly there are approaches that we have developed that we could apply elsewhere. We have learned things and we are more skilled. We have more capacity now. So I'm not sure if we have a model, but we do have some some things of value that could be seeded elsewhere, I think. Um, you said that the movie you sent to uh, UNED, uh, sorry? Uh, Amnesty. Amnesty, sorry. Um, was that maybe one of those turning points? Oh, okay, sorry. What, what was the turning point in, well, yeah. That, yeah, that, yeah, that, I'm also interested. Well, there, in I, was, I was just, um, there was no project, right? I, Amnesty knew I was out there, and so they'd asked if I would make a video report on forced evictions in Port Harcourt. I had no idea that there, were, there was an issue with forced evictions in Port Harcourt. I was mostly working in another part of, of the country. I couldn't find anyone else to do it, so I said I would do it, and then I found myself with a camera in that demolition that you saw. So, yeah, that, that was certainly the turning point, and as I say, it, it became the animating impulse, the idea that you could layer different forms of self-representation on whether cinematic, radiographic, uh, judicial, cartographic, and allow people to represent themselves in a way that could also be spatialized in, in the city, that, that could, could have a form. Um, and also institutional forms, change the nature of urban governance. So 
Yeah, I think that, that remains the animating impulse. And also there at the beginning, the idea that you could tell stories, that urban space was somehow a space of stories, was somehow a narrative space, and that we wanted to share with people the tools to tell different stories and, and to change the story. Um, is there a vision within the project that you can, uh, for instance, you want the young architects that are here to actually contribute, contribute or to help, or is it more oh, yeah. for location? And how would it? What What's the idea of telling the story and informing us about this? Well, I was invited, and <laughs> <laughs> um, I love Amsterdam, um, but yes, I mean, you know, very concretely, it'd be great. I'm, we're always looking for collaboration, right? I mean, this, this is a, a project which is founded on, on collaboration. So people sharing their skills and, and being committed to, to working in, in, in that space uh, is useful. So that's one of the reasons uh, why we tell the story. There's another more kind of strategic reason is one of the things we're trying to do is raise the visibility of these communities. And so the more places that we can tell this story, the more leverage it gives to, to people. Um, because these are communities that in many ways only appeared when they were made to disappear in spectacular demolitions. They were literally wiped off the map before they were even on the map. And we are trying to literally share with these communities the capacity to put themselves on the map. And that includes a, a discursive map, a map of discourse. You know, people who talk about these kinds of things and do this kind of thing, communities of practice. So, um, yeah, the, the, the vision to share would be um, get involved. I mean, ideally in this project, you know, but if not, in, in other projects like it, do some stuff. Not suggesting you're not doing lots of stuff, <laughs> right? I mean, but I'm... That's, you know what I mean. And, and, and now we know about Prince and Joy in right, Port Harcourt. Exactly. Yeah, so right, that's, yeah. right. There's a question on, on that side. So I was wondering if you have any other project next to this. Uh, and if not, what should be the end result of this project for you to be uh, happy or fulfilled? We, we don't have another project, because this is already too much, right? I mean, it's, it's quite an ambitious project, and it's a really small team. Um, that question of, like, when would we be happy? When would we say we succeeded is a really vexed question, because, you know, obviously never, right? Because we, we obviously can't do what we want to do which is to transform the global economy you know, and, 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 and the way in which we materially sustain ourselves by transforming the oil capital of, of Nigeria into the, the seed of the post-oil economy in Nigeria. You know, obviously, we, we can't do that. Um, we, we can't even transform political culture at a state level. I mean, the interests that are stacked against us are, are huge. I mean, if you just look in, in financial terms, you know, the, the amount of, of investment in political opacity, in an economy of extraction, in, in hydrocarbons, simply. So, um, we'll, we'll never be happy, we'll never, we'll never succeed. And, and what we, what, the way in which we proceed is on the principle of as if. Right? As if something were possible. Because otherwise, what? We know the trajectory that things are on currently, and we know it doesn't end well. So we know that if we don't do something, so we will, we will do this. And we hope that everything that we do means something in itself to the people who are doing it. And we hope that the circles and horizons of that meaning can expand and, and deepen. But 
we also want to retain a deep disquiet because that's what keeps us moving. If we're not rebelling, at least a sense of, of, of disquiet. Yeah. Uh, another question. I'm, I was a bit uh, curious about how does it work in Nigeria with uh, buildings? How is, how, how is it? Yeah, you know, it's... Uh, it's very fascinating to see what happens. Uh, it's very uh, amazing to see how much energy is in the people. But how do you land in such a country and wh what kind of uh, regulations do you find? I, I landed in there you know, from an accident of birth. I can, you know, whatever. You know, it's my dad. He just happened to be Nigerian. Um, so, so that's a biographical detail. Um, but there are obviously a lot of buildings in Nigeria because there are an awful lot of people, you know. Um, people build, mostly uh, self-initiated. A conservative estimate would say that 80% of all physical development in Nigeria is outside of government control, right? So people just build. Then buildings go up and occasionally they come down and you hope that there's no one in them when they do. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to build something with formal permission, not because what we're trying to do is simply formalize the informal, because that's not our intention, and I don't, I don't think it's the most productive way to go, but so that we can make an anchor, make a space where different kind of authorities, different forces, including state forces, can come together and valorize different forms of urban belonging. And to make a building that is permitted because that's strategically significant, because that hopefully then creates a, a space of relative safety and a sense of recognition. So, you know, Mostly negotiation is how things happen. And we're trying to negotiate this very gray space. There was someone who had... I don't know if that answered your question, but I mean, I can't speak to all buildings. There, there, there are a lot of buildings and a lot of ways of building. a little bit further, you know, and to really help people on a broader base. You wow. Know, that, I mean, that, that is actually the, uh, sure. the point. But, okay, I mean, you don't have to go to Port Harcourt to, to help people in Port Harcourt because Amsterdam and Port Harcourt are intimately connected. I mean, you saw that map, right? That map came from an archive here. I, I saw this afternoon a building which is now what, a fancy hotel or a restaurant, mm -hmm. which used to be the, the Shell headquarters. I mean, we are all implicated in the, materially implicated, in the economy that has relegated that part of the world to a sacrifice zone, to an extraction and a dumping zone. And, and so I think in many ways, the protests that were going on in London recently or have been going on elsewhere are significant for people in Port Harcourt. I mean, not immediately, not for their day-to-day -day lives, but in as much as we know it is necessary to change the material base which sustains the global economy, all efforts are, are significant. And because that material base is hydrocarbon-based at the moment, and because Port Harcourt is the oil capital of Nigeria, these kinds of actions are significant for that kind of place. But still come and visit, please. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, indeed, if you're also talking to Shell or to, or, yeah, so, such stakeholders. Um, as an organization, we are constitutionally uh, prohibited from talking to Shell. Um, we wouldn't accept funding from them because, 
although we could certainly use their money, it would be impossible. We would have no credibility. We could, we could, we could do everything in glass, right? Be totally transparent, do everything in glass, and people would still say that we're just getting rich, that we're just taking money from Shell, and because that's how it works. There are people who, who work for Shell who have wardrobes full of cash, and they give cash out. Not figuratively, it's what they do. Um, so, so Shell, no, but we do, particularly in the next phase of the project, want to engage a, a wider range of urban actors, including certain industrial and, and commercial actors. It's very tricky. It's very difficult to know how to proceed because for obvious reasons. Mm. There was a question. Oh, just, just to say one thing. We got, we, yeah. The Dutch Go government actually was an early funder. And uh, a, a really charming guy who worked for the Dutch government said to us, you're our fig leaf, you know, when we're asked questions. I shouldn't say that actually right now because we just have a, a funding application in with the Dutch embassy. Okay, go ahead. It's a, it's a joke. And, and you're on a live stream. <laughs> yeah, we, um, we talk about Shell, but also Amnesty International is a world big company, of course, with another, I want to say mask, but it, it, it is a good company probably. But we also know about uh, um, these good uh, working um, yeah, firms, not, but it is a firm at the end. Um, and and um, how, how, how is it working with Amnesty International and how do they go along with money? And uh, Because a lot of the times you also hear about that money gets stuck in certain positions or like, how that, does that work? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, Amnesty is indeed a large organization. There's some material differences for, between Shell and Amnesty. Yeah, Amnesty are not in the fossil fuel business. They don't, you know, it might, this or that office might be a shitty place to work. You, you know, you might have a, a nasty manager. They might, whatever. You might have strategic issues about their campaigning or you might have philosophical questions about the, the nature of human rights and whether that's problematic in itself. Fine. But there's a material difference between Amnesty and Shell. And um, it's, it's been challenging at times working with Amnesty because they're a massive and marvelous machine of many moving parts uh, and vertical and horizontal authorizations which have to happen for, for everything. So, you know, negotiating any large corporate entity or working with large development agencies, you know, it can be challenging. Um, but I'm pretty confident that... Um, their values are more closely aligned to ours than Shell's are. Um, so in, in that sense, it's less, it's, it's less problematic. And strategically, you know, I mean, quite aside from the personal relationships, um, they've been massively helpful. Do they provide knowledge? Well, first of all, Amnesty isn't a donor. So our, our relationship with Amnesty in, in some ways is kind of exceptional. And the, the exchange of knowledge, I think, has been both ways because we, we kind of met at a time when Amnesty was going through certain strategic and structural shifts. And, and I hope that in some ways they learned from our collaboration, learned about certain ways of involving rights holders in certain actions and you know, new strategies to campaigning and researching and, and stuff. Um, yeah, there's, there's, it's time for there's one last question I know here in the front, and, and there's one over there, and, and then we round up. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, we've discussed a lot about the economics and politics and social aspects, but we still do this in the framework of the Academy of Ar 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 Architecture. I'm sorry. Um, 
I was very impressed by your presentation and what you're doing in the, in the framework of the power of image. Everything you showed us, your slides, your, your, your cinema, your clips, your uh, graphics, is all one concept. Um, and I was wondering, I think, I, I think probably you're the responsible for this, or uh, a few of you in your team. And what's the relationship between the power of image and your T-shirts, your, 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 yes, mm -hmm. your posters of your, your exhibitions, everything has the same kind of concept. How is this done and what is this, what's the relationship mm -hmm. of design mm -hmm. with your participation mm -hmm. in the community? So I, I came to this project from filmmaking. So a project that I was deeply involved in for also 10 years prior to this, ended up in a film that was called The Act of Killing. And so I, I came to this with the conviction that stories matter. That the relationship between history, stuff which happens, and history, the story of stuff which happens, is, is intimately connected. And that powerful storytelling changes things. And I also came to this with the conviction that urban space is semiotic, or is full of meaning and, and, and signs. I mean, it's literally full of signs, but it, it's a significant space. And, and so uh, I was also interested, came at this wanting, and, and this is something that Anna came to this project to with as well, coming from the BBC where she spent many years very expertly and powerfully telling other people's stories, wanting to create a space where people could tell their own stories. And so what you're asking is, well, to what extent is that happening? Like, to what extent am I telling someone's story? Who is speaking for, for whom? Um, you know, in Port Harcourt, there are not a lot of great cinemas. I mean, there are a couple, but we get big Hollywood blockbusters, so I, I, I need to watch movies occasionally. So I just see the big Hollywood movies. And at the end, you often see 15,000 people were involved in the making of this film. And I think it's the same here. Sure, films have directors, right? They have directors, directors of photography, they have art directors. Films are deeply collaborative ventures. And although we still retain a kind of award system, which individualizes authorship. There's no getting around, and of course you have auteurs, you have people with vision, but there's no getting around the collaborative nature of film. Same with science, right? There's a debate at the moment about the Nobel Prizes and how, how can one person or two people get a physics prize when it depends on a whole massive pyramid of stuff. So, yes, you know, I have a point of view. And yes, we care about how things look and how things sound. Um, and yes, that's strategically significant. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, it, 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 it matters. Um, I mean, I probably wouldn't have been invited here. Like, I was invited here because, you know, you wouldn't just invite me here to, to tell a worthy story, right? Well, you, you might. Yeah, and I, <laughs> I, I, I think it's a very good question and it's a good point because we need this image mm -hmm. and we have like half of the audience uh, is indeed uh, in design knowing what that image can mean and what the power of the image is. And definitely also that's part of it. Mm. Um, but from my side, before we go to the last question, there's a lot of emotion in it. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I think it's also the sense of the filmmaking to show that emotion and then you, you, you actually know joy now and you see what Prince can do. Mm -hmm. And th that, that was triggers, that's my personal trigger. But this trigger is important it, but, right, because yeah. emotion yeah. is mediated. Yeah. I mean, it's material, it's physical. Yeah. I mean, on a somatic level, I mean, it's, it's material. So yes, of course, everything is mediated. Um, I mean, cities, are, it's stuff. Um, and what we're trying to do is shape stuff, right? We're trying to, to contribute to a, a, a space of, 
uh, more creatively and equitably designed cities, institutional design as well as spatial design. And also, we're trying to make music. I mean, not everything is instrumental, right? We're just, we're not doing everything just to make something else happen. We're also doing some things because they're fun. Fun, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was just saying that. Mm. We, we go to the last question. You have the honor. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, this kind of feels like pressure now. Um, but, yeah, I think in general, um, what I, I gauge is that um, almost... As here, most of us are architects and urban designers and landscape designers. We see the city in terms of built reality. Um, whereas, I, I guess, and maybe this is your opinion as well, have you, uh, your project kind of shows that the story of a city or the story of a place isn't, is kind of more, is, is more immaterial than just the building in sorts. Um, so I guess is architecture, f for us as architects or urbanists, is it really, I think as well, you said you didn't want to fetishize the, the building and you didn't, you didn't want to speak because the architects, because you're not, but then, um, huh, I guess I'm saying is, is architecture really the, is it really the important part of this story? Is it ever the important part of the story? Is it, um, does it really ever, is it really sufficient enough to actually tell the stories that you speak of? It's necessary, but not sufficient. Okay. Michael Wumedimo, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all um, for coming. Uh, have a safe journey home. You can have drinks, I think, downstairs. And for the students, there's a signature list uh, when you're walking out. Thank you, and uh, maybe till next week.